Manuel is my name. I guess you all know me now after this conference. Um, I'm also part of Monetative, and uh, this is a really quick introduction to what Vollgeld and sovereign money is ac actually is. Um, so um, we've already heard of Michael Kumov that uh, there's still a lot of misconception about the current money system. And um, what has been very remarkable is that from 2014 on, two uh, central banks have really put forth very, very uh, clear reports and argument, uh, arguments how the money system actually works. So we see here a quote from um, a paper Money Creation in the Modern Economy by Bank of England. Money creation in practice differs from some popular misconceptions. Banks do not act simply as intermediaries lending out deposits that sell, uh, savers place with them, or nor do they multiply up central bank money to create new loans and deposits. They go to the intermediaries of loanable funds and the multi multi um, multiplier theory. Whenever a bank makes a loan, it simultaneously creates a matching deposit in the borrower's bank account, thereby creating new money. The German Bundesbank has also uh, put forth another uh, report. And um, I mean, I'm not going to have to go through that, but basically saying the same thing. So uh, over the last years, there has been a dramatic shift in uh, the, to my mind, in the um, uh, communication about the current money system, also from central banks. And I remember uh, when I got across the uh, functioning of the current money system four years ago, a lot of people said this is a conspiracy theory. Uh, banks uh, do, cannot and do not uh, create money. Uh, I was uh, approaching professors at my university. They still believe in those uh, theories. So um, we're still in the infancy, I believe, to really um, get the experts and professors to understand how the current money system works. And so this is basically how it works. We have two different monetary, uh, money cycles. There's a, a small one, which is, um, do you have the clicker here? Yeah. Uh, this, this money is created by commercial banks. There's no um, interference of the central banks because they don't have access to the non-banking sector. They only have access through cash, and, uh, but not uh, in the digital money sphere, so to say. Um, it goes like this. I guess you all have seen it. It's just a balance sheet extension. We have here on the asset side and deposits here. And uh, banks are special because the institutions that actually can hold deposits for their customers and use these deposits by adding uh, the balance sheet on both sides, new money, which is these deposits, which is bank liabilities, are created. Um, the reserves position remains the same. So there is no immediate uh, increase in uh, central bank reserves. Um, the same happens when banks actually buy existing assets. So uh, shares, bonds, um, but also real estate, for example. Um, so what the current money system actually looks like, basically this. So we have banks creating their own money. And all, you can imagine, uh, we've, we've just had a talk of um, um, uh, Ole Bjerg about parity. You can imagine that this, for example, is Deutsche Bank, uh, more Bank, or Stanley is investment. Here, so to say, and if a deposit is transferred within their own balance sheet, there's no central bank reserves uh, involved. If we only had one giant commercial bank, there would no, uh, there would be no need for a central bank. So, each of the banks creates their own money sphere, and then to channel funds from that bank to that bank, what they need to have is some kind of liquidity, and this is the central bank reserves. Um, but let's get back to uh, one bank, because this is uh, much more reasonable. The ideal case is that for the real economy. Yeah? Um, but what actually happens is, this is an example of Great Britain. This is, this is the lending of the top five banks from 97 to 2007. So the decade before the, the crisis ha uh, ha actually happened is,
went directly into housing market. 37% went into uh, ownership transfers in the financial markets, which is here the, the, the gambling roulette table. Um, oh, this money, most of this money, was created without creating additional um, things and objects and services. So uh, existing bonds and shares traded. And if you create more money, but don't increase the, the amount of the existing assets, what happens? Inflation. Yeah? And that's uh, actually what uh, has happened. Only 13% of the money that the real economy. And, uh, these numbers are quite um, representative for many of the uh, Western countries. Uh, so Canada is a very good example. Um, uh, Germany is very distinct because we have a different monetary system uh, or money system. We have small community banks that lend to the real economy. And uh, there are some economists that say that is why Germany has not faced such a dramatic uh, house price increase, so to say, during the crisis or before the crisis. So um, we see the, the, uh, what has led or, uh, banks, no, I, I keep it different. The money creation of private banks actually went into speculative purposes in the financial markets and the housing markets. And what has happened is, as you see, this, the, the money supply increased, but it went directly into the existing assets. So house prices have risen extremely. And um, this is uh, the asset price inflation that most central banks, or basically all the central banks, are not focusing at all. So the consumer, the consumer price index only um, uh, includes consumer prices, and they exclude all the banks actually do. That money is for the purposes of existing assets. This always leads has happened um, since the uh, gold standard was abolished to a 19. See, this is a very impressive chart also for A dramatic expansion of money. Um, I'm only talking about bank money. I, I know we have uh, heard talks about other types of forms of money, uh, which is of course even worse. And what uh, was the result of that? Commercial banks went directly into the housing market and drove up the prices um, because it was only a small. When the uh, loans that the banks are giving out are repaid, there's a money supply contraction. So the net position between uh, granting loans and repaying loans is actually the change in the money system, uh, in, the, in the money supply. Yeah? Um, and that's basically the functioning of our current money system. So banks grant loans, money supply is rising. When loans are repaid, um, the money supply shrinks. And if the net position is negative, the whole uh, supply shrinks. Um, that's that. Okay, so real quickly to quantitative easing, what's that? That's this. Uh, what has happened is central banks have created enormous amounts of central bank reserves through quantitative easing. But um, in the last couple of years, not a lot of that money uh, went into the real economy. And we can see that by uh, money supply. Uh, th sorry, this is the credit to private sector. So this is credit creation by um, uh, private sector. And this is the increase in there was not much of an, uh, of an uh, effect. And this is basically only due to the uh, system we are operating in. An alternative would be uh, people's quantitative easing or uh, digital cash, where the central bank gets access to the non-banks and can uh, um, the uh, non-banking sector. And that the aim of the 
sovereign money or the folgat to uh, basically prohibit commercial banks to create money and have uh, a central bank or a public monetary authority. Uh, we have uh, these discussions inside the IMMR and uh, inside the International Monetary Movement. Um, either a central bank or another public monetary authority should be the only institution that creates the money and it should uh, so as an asset. Yeah? So and that's, uh, I mean, uh, Edgar was intermediary. So they would act exactly how most people and most economists and most politicians actually think of the current money system. They believe that banks are intermediaries and take savings and lend these out. That would be the reality in a sovereign money system. So uh, we've also had uh, um, the talk of Michael Kumov about the flaws of the macroeconomic models. The macroeconomic models, as far as I understand them correctly, as a, a student that has uh, graduated from my master's in finance uh, this year, um, the models actually model a sovereign money system because they don't see uh, the banks as creators of the, of the money supply. Um, so now the clicker does not work anymore. Um, implications, uh, sovereign money system. The problem in the current money system, uh, we are prone to the possibility of bank runs. If everybody, I mean, most of you have heard of it, if everybody wants to uh, cash in their deposits at a commercial bank, there is not enough money, which is cash, basically. That's the only legal tender. There's not enough money to be around. And that's always been a big problem in the past. We've seen that in the 30s as a major problem. We have seen some bank runs uh, in the 2007-2008 financial crisis. And basically the fear of all central banks because then they have to <laughs> supply lots and lots of, uh, lots and lots of uh, physical cash to the ATMs so that uh, the um, uh, news are not spread around that all the uh, deposits cannot be uh, uh, withdrawn, so to say. Um, if you only have one type of money that is secured by the state, <clears throat> then there is no possibility uh, of a bank run because the money is there, it is yours. Currently, when you have deposits in your account, this is not your money. You basically granted a loan to a commercial bank and uh, what they promise you is that you can anytime withdraw the money and get the cash. But this is just the promise and uh, it's not working. Yeah? Um, that's the first point. Uh, we would have an elimination of the bank runs. Um, second, we, have, we would have safe money and a safe method of payment also in crisis. Because what happens in crisis is that the, uh, um, uh, the, the nominal value of the assets that are in the balance sheet of the banks, they decrease. And what happens then? They have to uh, compensate that in their equity, equity position. But since banks only hold very few uh, uh, a very few uh, equ equity position, uh, a very small equity position, um, a pr a asset price reduction of, let's say, 10% could wipe out any bank, basically speaking. Um, but what means that? What, what does that mean, wipe out a bank? If a bank is bankrupt, then your money cannot be used as money anymore because you are the uh, you have a claim on the commercial bank, and if it's bankrupt, then they cannot give you the money. So the whole payment system is frozen, right? and that was basically a, one of the biggest fears, 2007 and 2008. If we would have let the commercial banks go bankrupt, the whole payment system would have been uh, would have collapsed, and if the whole digital payment system collapses, then of course the whole economy collapses because nobody can imagine. Uh, uh, doing all the business with physical cash. Yeah? So uh, with a fault system, we would also in crisis have a stable and uh, safe payment system. Next point, bank can go, uh, banks can go bust. Uh, there's no, I mean, we, we would still have to find a solution for the too big to fail problem. Um, but regular banks could easily go bust because the money uh, you have in your account is then separated from the balance sheet of the bank. So it's outside of the balance sheet of the bank. If you want to save, then you can give the money to the bank and then the bank can, just as a mutual fund, um, use that uh, money and channel it to some investors. Yeah? 
So that's basically how everybody is thinking of money, uh, of, of banks. Yeah? And um, if you decide to lend the money to your bank, then of course you have a problem if it goes bust. But your money you want to have safe is not affected by that. So um, then of course, if you lend out to uh, a, a, a commercial bank your money, then you would of, of course have to bear the risk. The last point is there's a dramatic reduction of government and private debt through the one-time syringe. So that's a bit complicated. I will quickly get into that um, because the, the idea is that the whole credit system, the whole M1 monetary aggregate, sorry, is changed for an active money, so to say. So it's not debt-based anymore. The uh, state or uh, the, 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 the state agency creates that money free of debt and this money is then channeled into, the, into circulation whenever the loans are being repaid. So imagine you have uh, 1,000 euros outstanding in the real economy, and then uh, from time to time, these 1,000 euros, which are credit, are being repaid to the bank. And in the current money system, this money would disappear. Yeah? So banks would have to create more money than 1,000 to keep the uh, monetary uh, supply stable or even increasing. And um, through the one-time seniorage, um, what would happen is that, uh, that's my alarm that I should stop now, <laughs> um, is that this money can then be used, which is debt-free, to repay uh, uh, debts. So there's a, an extreme advantage to uh, bring down government debt uh, across many countries. We, we see that here. Um, we have, these, these are 2011 numbers, um, outstanding uh, government debt would have been rising dramatically ever since. Uh, this is the percentage of GDP before the transition. Then you would um, use that amount of money, M1, and transfer that from credit money into sovereign money, into Vollgeld. And that money could be, for example, used to repay government. And then uh, you would see, for example, for Germany, 2,000 uh, billion, 2, billion, and from 80 to 30%. Some, for, exa for example, Switzerland in 2011 would have gone completely free of government debt. And you see the dramatic reduction. And uh, this is a little bit hard to get his, uh, the, the head around, but. To its like inflation, uh, the current money system is with an interest in uh, making money, so profit oriented. So in good times, they would create more money and more money and more money and drive up asset prices and then use these new uh, asset prices that or assets that have been driven up in, in prices as collateral so they can grant more money and then use that as collateral and create more money. So it's like a little bit of a Ponzi scheme. Uh, uh, this would not be possible anymore because the commercial banks would not increase the money supply. So there's a dramatic... Uh, I don't know how you call that in English, uh, uh, flattening of the credit cycle. Yeah. Because the uh, central bank should only create money for the real economy and only for, um, uh, in, in, uh, in English, it would be um, potentially oriented, so to say. Yeah? So um, you, the idea is to measure more or less how much money is needed in the real economy and then provide this uh, money. And um, yeah, so that's basically it. There have been some, uh, uh, in two, was a strong debate in Iceland. We also have that report uh, down there. You can get it, it's written by, uh, about the, the current money system, also about a sovereign money system. And uh, the parliament that, that uh, was replaced due to some tax issues. I don't know if you remember that. The president had some problems with uh, the taxes. And then the parliament got replaced. But the parliament was uh, quite eager to change the money into a sovereign money system. Um, they had a, a, a there in 2015 um, a discussing uh, Folgeld. And of course, also this year, was the Folgeld Initiative in Switzerland. Uh, it was a major success, even though only 25% of the uh, inhabitants of uh, Switzerland voted pro introducing a system. I, of course, you know, in Switzerland, there's, it's possible to have referendums. 
Um, and uh, we've had uh, Maurizio and Emma talking about uh, the, the lessons learned of that. Um, but it's been a huge step forward in the direction of explaining how the current money system works and also showing uh, possible reform. These are some headlines. Um, and you see that the major um, magazines, newspapers, and all that wrote about that. Martin Wolf from Financial Times, uh, why the Swiss should vote for Folgert. So it was very interesting. A lot of media was against it. Some uh, saw it very neutral and said that it, there are advantages, there are disadvantages. And a very few said uh, definitely uh, pro Folgert, do it. And um, as you can see here, um, no, you can't see it here, but there's been a lot of articles starting with an explanation of what I've just given you of how the money system actually works. And this is a major step forward because um, this is basically the, uh, so to me, the success of the sovereign money system was that the whole discussion about money and the monetary system was uh, evolving and was started. And um, so I think it's just the beginning and uh, that's basically it. Sorry.